All right, turn with me to Revelation chapter 6. Over the last few weeks, we've been enjoying uh, the beauty of heaven. In chapter 4, verse 1, we saw the Apostle John was caught up into the presence of the Lord. He was in the throne room of God. And I believe that's where the rapture takes place in the book of Revelation. And he's blown away by everything he sees and hears. He um, sees God on the throne, but he describes him in these beautiful colors. He says God is like a jasper stone, crystal clear like a diamond. Uh, he sees him as a sardius stone, blood red. Uh, he sees this emerald halo, this arch. Rainbow, it says, the emerald rainbow above his head, probably like a halo. And then John sees these four amazing, awesome creatures called cherubim, mighty angels, and they hover around the throne of God. They praise the Lord continually, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Um, John also sees the saints around the throne of God. So we will be there in chapters 4 and 5. He sees the bride of Christ casting their crowns at the feet of the Lord, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, chapter 4, verse 11. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. And then in chapter 5, John sees the, the title deed to planet Earth in the right hand of God the Father, and it's the scroll that the Father has in his hand and is sealed with seven seals. And an angel shouts out for all to hear, who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? John begins to weep and sob because it says there was no one found anywhere in the universe, on earth or in heaven, anywhere that was worthy to take the scroll, to loose the seals. And so John begins weeping, he's sobbing, and um, in, in his mind he's thinking, this means that Satan is going to be in charge of planet earth forever because nobody can reclaim this world back to the father because again this is the title deed to planet earth it's not just what what you know it's not just judgments in this seal that's not why he's weeping he's not weeping because god's going to judge the world he's weeping because he thinks this world's going to remain in satan's control forever and so he begins to be you know overcome with emotion and then we're told one of the 24 elders comes to John and he says don't weep the lion of the tribe of Judah the root of David has prevailed to open the scroll and loose loose its seven seals and then when John turns around expecting to see the lion of the tribe of Judah he sees a lamb he sees Jesus as a lamb that was slain still bearing the marks of the crucifixion and then it all makes sense to John. He realizes, of course, Jesus is our Redeemer. Christ alone has redeemed the people on this planet. He's, he alone redeemed those uh, who, you know, are coming in the future here. He's redeemed those um, on this world. And so when Jesus takes the scroll, we saw in chapter 5 that the, the rest of chapter 5 is this great, amazing praise and worship time where the 24 elders representing the church begin to praise the Lord, and the angels join in, and then all of creation joins in, and it's just this amazing celebration for who the Father and the Son are and what they've done. Now, beginning in chapter 6, Jesus takes this scroll, and he methodically, deliberately starts to peel off each seal on this seven-sealed scroll. And every time he peels off, you'll think of it as a scroll. You, open, you peel one off, you open it a little bit, you read what's there. You open it further, there's another seal, you open that. And so there's seven seals on this scroll, and we'll see the first six seals in chapter 6. It's not the end when he gets to the sixth or the seventh seal. That brings on seven trumpet judgments. And that's not the end, because when he blows the seventh trumpet, it brings on seven bowl judgments. And as we see, these things get more and more intense as we go through the book of Revelation. So chapter 6 through 19 is known as the Great Tribulation. This is the time that Daniel spoke of in Daniel chapter 9, uh, verses 24 to 27. D Gabriel gives him this vision of 490 years 483 of those years have taken place from Nehemiah going forth to rebuild Jerusalem 
to Messiah being put to death. That's there in Daniel chapter 4 or 9, verses 24 to 27. It's 483 years. And there's a final seven-year period that's in the future, which is what we look at in chapter 6 through 19. It's known as the 70th week of Daniel. Jeremiah chapter 30, starting in verse 5, speaks of this time frame. And it's interesting because I usually, I usually just quote verse 7, but for our woke age in which we live, I thought chapter uh, verses 5 through 6 are very appropriate, as you'll see. <laughs> for thus says the Lord, we have heard a voice of trembling. This is again speaking of judgment in the last days. Of fear and not of peace. Ask now and see, here it is, whether a man is ever in labor with child. <laughs> Can men get pregnant? No. So why do I see every man with his hands on his loins like a woman in labor and all faces turned pale because it's the time of judgment? Alas, verse 7, for the, great, uh, the day is great so that none is like it and it is the time of Jacob's trouble but he shall be saved out of it. Now, who's Jacob? That's another name for Israel. So this is a time of Israel's trouble. And as we go through the, the Word of God, we see that Israel is going to be in the midst of the Great Tribulation. According to Zechariah 13, two-thirds of all the Jews are going to be put to death by the Antichrist that we'll look at this morning. But one-third will be saved. And when Christ returns, every Jew that's alive during the Great Tribulation, they will get saved. They will turn to Christ for salvation. And so we see how God will save Israel out of this uh, horrific time that we're going to look at beginning this morning here in uh, Revelation chapter 6. The Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter both call this the day of the Lord, this time of judgment. Jesus calls this the Great Tribulation. Again, it's a seven-year period. And he says this in Matthew 24, starting in verse 21. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. Here's how bad it's going to be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. As we'll see, this seven-year great tribulation time it's going to be unparalleled in human history. It's going to be so brutal. And every one of these events that we're looking at in chapter 6 have not taken place. I say that because there's a doctrine called preterism that says that all Bible prophecy was fulfilled in 70 A.D. That's not even close. When we go through this, these chapters from chapter 6 through 19, you realize none of this has happened yet. There's not even close to any of these taking place yet. And so we need to look at these things and realize God's judgment is horrendous. It's a time that nobody has ever seen, and it'll never be this bad again. So we'll see how they could not have been fulfilled, these prophecies, earlier. They won't be fulfilled until this time frame. In fact, many of these prophecies we're going to look at in the coming weeks could not happen until our time frame because of all the technology that will be required to fulfill some of these prophecies that we will read about, like numbering every person in the world. We couldn't do it 2,000 years ago, but we have the technology today, as we'll see. I personally believe that soon after the rapture of the church, which could happen at any moment, chapter 6 will soon follow. Now remember, the promise Jesus gave to... The Church of Philadelphia in chapter 3, uh, they were the faithful church. He didn't have any rebuke for them. And one of the great promises in that chapter is chapter 3, verse 10. This is what Jesus tells these genuine believers in uh, Revelation 3, 10. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from, that means to keep you out from among, the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Again, chapter 6 through 19 is that hour of trial that's coming upon the whole world. 
The promise of Jesus is to keep us from the great tribulation, not take us through it, but to take us out from among it. Now, a, a few weeks ago, I mentioned that this scroll that Jesus has plays a very prominent role throughout the book of Revelation. The property that Jesus is reclaiming is planet Earth, but the final act of reclaiming his property only takes place after all the seals and all the you know trumpets and all these things take place. Chapter 19 is when we see Jesus returning at his second coming, and then we will come back with him in chapter 19, starting in verse 11, we see the church coming back with the Lord. The only way we can come back with him is to go and be with him before these events. So let's pick up in chapter 6, verse 1. Everybody's been worshiping, praising the Lord, all of heaven and earth, worshiping God at this moment. And then chapter 6, 1. Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals. So this is Jesus with the scroll. And he opens one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a loud voice, like thunder, Come and see! And so he does. John watches, and he's going to witness all these events that are going to take place. And this is what's going to happen after the church is removed from planet Earth. Verse 2, And I looked, and behold, a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow. And a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. This has become known as the first of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Uh, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, it's been used in movies. It's been used as nicknames. I think the Notre Dame football team, their front four were the four horsemen of the apocalypse. This is the real deal here. The first seals open, and the rider on the white horse comes forth. Is this Jesus Christ? Absolutely not. As we'll see in a moment, for many reasons, this is not Jesus. In fact, Jesus is the one who is opening this seal off the scroll. Now, we know that Jesus will be riding back again in chapter 19 on a white horse, this man on a white horse is an imposter. He is a counterfeit. In fact, as we'll see, he is going to pretend to be the world's savior. He's going to pretend to be the world's Messiah. But again, he is the Antichrist. This is when the Antichrist comes on the scene after the rapture of the church. If somebody handed you a, you know, a dollar bill or a $20 bill and it's got, you know, Donald Trump's picture on it or Joe Biden or Barack Obama, you would instantly realize this is a counterfeit. They're not on any of our coins or in our, any of our notes. This man is the anti-Messiah. This is not Jesus. This is the Antichrist. The Bible has a lot to say about the Antichrist. Not only will he turn the world against Jesus Christ, he will force the world at some point to worship him as God. Now, at the beginning of his rule and reign, most people on earth are going to think this guy is great. This guy's a wonderful person. He's one of the greatest politicians. He'll solve all the problems. Again, the rapture is going to take place. There's going to be an interesting void that happens when the rapture takes us out of here. This guy will come on the scene and supposedly have all the answers. People will think, this guy's the man. Uh, my dad used to call politicians honey lips because they would just speak sweet things. They'd tell you whatever you wanted to hear, and this guy will be the ultimate politician. He will be totally possessed, as we'll see in chapter 13, by Satan himself. And so he will have all these lying signs and wonders that he'll perform. Notice it says he has a bow, but there's no arrows. So again, it's a symbol of him coming with a peace plan. He'll be very diplomatic. He'll be one of the most gifted politicians of all time. And so in the beginning of his reign, he will conquer the world diplomatically. But as we'll see, his peace will not last. Notice it also says he's wearing a crown. This is not the crown that Jesus wears. Um, Jesus wears, in the Greek, it's diadema. It's the crown of authority. This is the Stephanos. We're given Stephanos crowns, not the same as what Jesus wears. This is Stephanos that the Antichrist wears. 
It's a temporary crown. Jesus is the only one that wears the diadema, the crown of authority. The Apostle Paul describes the Antichrist like this, 2 Thessalonians 2, starting in verse 9. The coming of the lawless one, that's another name for the Antichrist, is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And so again, this guy's a great con artist. And the tragedy is most people will follow him during the beginning of the Great Tribulation. Now, one of the first things he does when he comes to power is to make this peace treaty with the nation of Israel and the Arab nations. Every time we try to do that, we intervene. Uh, George W. tried to do it where he wanted to split Israel in half, give half to the Palestinians. Read Joel chapter 3, verse 1, because God says, This is my land, do not divide it. <laughs> you're, you're asking for trouble. Donald Trump tried to do it. You're asking for trouble if you try to divide the land of Israel. This guy is going to be successful at bringing peace between Israel and the Arab nations. Up to this point, it's been impossible, but the bait he'll use to lure them in will be the promise to rebuild the temple on the Temple Mount. When we go to Jerusalem, we'll go up on the Temple Mount if, if, the, if we're able to. Usually we're able to get up there, and you'll see right where this temple is going to be built. You have the Dome of the Rock, you have the Mosque Alasque next to it, and then there's on the north side of the Dome of the Rock is an open space where the temple will probably be built. It's not the Lord's Temple. This will be the Antichrist temple, but the Jews are going to build this thinking we're going to worship, we're going to sacrifice to the Lord once again. When Jesus returns, he's going to obliterate the whole temple mount, and according to Ezekiel 40 to 44, he's going to put his own temple there. That'll be the millennial temple that'll last for a thousand years. Be that as it may, when the Antichrist shows up, the Jewish people are going to think this is our Messiah. Jesus says about the Antichrist how the Jewish people will be deceived. He says this in John chapter 5, verse 43. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you will receive. And that's exactly what they will do. They will receive the Antichrist. They'll believe his lies, but eventually they'll have their eyes opened up and they'll realize that he is a liar, he is a deceiver. The signing of this peace treaty that we'll read about here in a second in Daniel is when the seven years start with the signing of that peace treaty. And once that's signed, the seven years begin. And this is what we read in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. Part of the prophecy Daniel receives from the angel Gabriel says, then he, this is the Antichrist, shall confirm a covenant, that means make a peace treaty, with many for one week. And as you study it out, that's the 70th week of Daniel. That's the seven-year period, that one week. But in the middle of the week, so three and a half years into that peace treaty, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. So the Antichrist is going to you know, break that promise he makes with the Jews. And on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. This will bring the abomination of desolation. So three and a half years into that seven-year peace treaty, what happens is the Antichrist will go into that temple he allowed the Jews to build, and he will go in the temple and say, Worship me, I am God. That is what the abomination of desolation is. The Apostle Paul says it like this, 2 Thessalonians 2, starting in verse 4, Paul says of the Antichrist, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. It'll become very you know, clear very quickly, he's a liar, he's a deceiver, and that's when Jesus says, when you see this, flee, get out of Israel, get out of Jerusalem, leave Judea, because that's when major great tribulation is going to take place. The final three and a half years are going to be worse than the first three and a half years. 
So Jesus speaks of this event, Matthew 24, 15. Jesus says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. And then he goes on to describe how there's going to be great tribulation that's coming upon the earth, and unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be able to survive. This is when God's wrath comes pouring out horribly. And so far from the rider on this white horse being, you know, the answer to the world's problems, the Antichrist will call, cause more and more devastation and destruction. So that's the first seal. Look at verse 3. Here we have the second seal. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature. So these are those four cherubim around the throne of God. Here's the second one says, come and see, verse 4, another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another, and there was given him a great sword. And so as, he, as Jesus removes the second seal, here we have this red horse come forth. Red horse speaks of war, bloodshed, and it's this false Messiah, his peace will not last very long at all. In fact, war breaks out very quickly. And as it says here, people will start killing, they'll start slaughtering one another. And just as quickly as the world thought, we finally attain peace on earth, goodwill toward men, as we'll be singing here in the next few weeks, devastation comes. Nation will rise against nation. Destruction follows. The Apostle Paul summarizes it like this in 1 Thessalonians 5. When you read through that chapter, um, very quickly, he, he says, we and us, when he's talking about the church, he'll say they and them when he's talking about the unsaved. So Apostle Paul says, for when they, the unsaved, say peace and safety, they think they've attained it, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. The Bible is very clear. There will not be world peace all over this planet until the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ himself, returns to this planet. It's only when Jesus returns that that first part of the Lord's Prayer will become a reality. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That only happens when Jesus comes back from heaven to earth. But in the meantime, until Christ returns, this world is going to experience an increase in violence and terrorism and war. And we're seeing it ramping up even in our midst, even in our day. I mean, we're seeing violence out of control all over the place. Jesus says it'll be like the days of Noah, which was, you know, categorized as a place of violence. We're seeing violence on the increase. It's just the way it is. And what we see in the world today, this is the restrained version. Remember the restrainer, Paul mentions in 2 Thessalonians 2, when the restrainer is removed, that's the Holy Spirit who fills the church. When he's removed, then it's the unrestrained version and Satan goes crazy. So what we're seeing now is a restrained version. Can you imagine how wicked, how horrible, how violent things are going to get once the salt, the light, is taken out of here when Jesus removes us? So he's seeing violence on the increase, wars taking place here. Look at verse 5. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. And so when he removes the third seal, the black horse of famine shows up. I mean, this is the natural progression. You know, the lies of the Antichrist, then you have wars. And because of all the wars worldwide, these aren't little skirmishes here and there. These are going to be, you know, major wars taking place. I mean, what's happening in Ukraine is very minor compared to what's going to happen at this time when country after country, nation going after nation, and it's going to be devastating. During this time, it says, 
A quart of wheat for a denarius. A quart of wheat is what you need to make one meal for the day. A denarius was a day's wage. So you'd have to work a full day just to have enough wheat for one meal. Or enough barley, you know, three measures of barley for a denarius to feed a family. And that's not very significant. But for one meal. Notice the oil and wine were not to be harmed. In other words, the rich will not be hurt at this point, but it's not going to take long for all of it to be wiped out. When you look at what's going on in Ukraine right now with Russia, um, Ukraine produces 10% of the world's wheat harvest. And so now they say 50% of the wheat harvest in Ukraine has been wiped out, destroyed, not able to deliver. So now it's down to 5% of the world's market has been lost because of what's happening there. Can you imagine with 90, 95% of all the wheat destroyed because of all the wars that are taking place throughout the world, it is going to be brutal. Look at verse 7. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and the name of him who sat on it was Death. And Hades followed with him, and power was given to them over a fourth of the earth. Take note of that, a fourth of the earth, to kill with the sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts, and, and that can mean all kinds of beasts from wild creatures to little viruses, by the beasts of the earth. But can you imagine, as Jesus removes the fourth seal, this pale horse of death goes forth. It says, Hades, or hell, follows after death. As a result of the Antichrist's failed policies, these wars will just ramp up, quickly followed by, it says here, a fourth of the world's population being destroyed in a very short time. Now, praise the Lord that the body of Christ, you and I, we will not be here when this takes place. But we will be with John in heaven watching all these things unfold. Uh, it's not on the screen, but I encourage you to write down 1 Thessalonians 5.9 and Romans 5.9. Just think of 5.9 because both of them talk about the wrath of God. For we are not destined for wrath, 1 Thessalonians 5.9, but to obtain salvation through Jesus Christ. Romans 5.9, much more than having now been Justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath to come. God's wrath is being poured out. We're not destined for that. We are not going to face his wrath. We've already experienced the wrath fulfilled because Jesus took the wrath we deserve upon himself when he hung on the cross. This is why he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was taking all the wrath, judgment we deserve for our sins upon himself. He paid the price in full. Now, if you say, I don't want Jesus, then you'll go through God's wrath. But if you say yes to Jesus, you've passed from death to life. The wrath has been taken away from you. You will never experience the wrath of God. Now, the only thing that prevents this world from total annihilation will be the return of Jesus Christ. Now, in chapter 9, Verse 15, we'll see what the, the, the sixth trumpet judgment, one-third of the world is wiped off the you know, planet. One-third is destroyed with that trumpet blast. So here you have one-fourth. Then you have one-third. So just in a matter of those two judgments, you have half of the world's population destroyed. Did you realize just this month we topped 8 billion people on planet Earth? I'll be generous and say, let's say a billion people are raptured, leave seven billion on earth, and during the, these two ju judgments, three and a half billion people will be wiped out. I mean, that's hard to fathom. I mean, that's brutal beyond comprehension. I mean, that's just amazing. That happens before the second half of the Great Tribulation. That starts in chapter 11, the second half. So even in the first half, we see just tremendous devastation. So 8 billion people. i got to pull this up real quick if I can, hopefully. Um, just speaking of the 8 billion people that we just surpassed that, I, I loved what uh, Ken Ham said about this. 
You CEO, founder of Answers in Genesis, said the 8 billion figure represents mankind's fulfillment of God's commandment to be fruitful and multiply. I guess we have been. Earth didn't give rise to life. God created life. He formed the earth to be inhabited, Isaiah 45, 18, by that life. Um, Ken Ham says, And the crowning jewel of his creation is mankind, Adam and Eve. Yes, all of God's creation is beautiful, though now it groans from sin, and he cares for it. But the crown, the most beautiful jewel, is mankind that bears his image. So we shouldn't bemoan what 8 billion people might do to the planet, like Bill Gates wanted, wants to get down to 1 billion, right, um, and others. We should celebrate that there are 8 billion image bearers of God living on this wonderful planet he has made for us. Consider that evolutionists believe modern man has existed for over 200,000 years. And yet, as the news article I linked above states, we didn't even hit 1 billion people until 200 years ago. So, for tens and tens of thousands of years, humanity's size somehow just didn't grow? Did it stay ridiculously small for almost an incomprehensible amount of time before suddenly exploding in our modern era? That doesn't make any sense, even with our medical advances. In this evolutionary view, if we use conservative numbers, there should be a whopping 10 to the... 10 to the 100th power of people on planet Earth. If we started 200,000 years ago, as the evolutionists say, we should have 10 to the 100th power, which he says is more atoms than there are in the universe. And that's only going back 50,000 years in supposed human history. Go back 200,000 years and the problem just gets worse. If the Earth's, Earth's population is only a few thousand years ago, few thousand years old, having reset after the flood, then even using a conservative estimate for population growth, 8 billion is a very reasonable number for us to be reaching in 2022. As always, the observational evidence confirms God's word, not evolutionary imaginings, he concluded. I think that's important, you know, because we're so worried about the population. God will take care of the population. He's going to reduce it significantly, and then he's going to bring us back, and then this world's going to be repopulated by those who make it through the Great Tribulation time. So here we are in the midst of this, seeing horrendous things taking place. But look at these verses in Matthew 24, because this is the same thing that we're seeing here with these first four seals opening up. Matthew 24, starting in verse 4. And Jesus answered and said to them, this is when they ask, what's going to be signs of your coming and the end of the age and all these things? Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many, the ultimate being the Antichrist. You'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. That's the second one, right? The horse brings wars. See that you're not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines. We just saw that, pestilences. And in a moment, we'll see earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows or birth pains. And so things are getting close to the end. But even in the midst of this horrendous judgment we see in these chapters, we still see flashes of God's grace and mercy breaking through. God does not take pleasure in destroying. He doesn't want to destroy the wicked. He doesn't take pleasure in the destruction of the wicked. Sometimes we do. I do. You hear about some evil person being destroyed. Yeah! God doesn't take pleasure in that. You know, we groan and moan, oh no, that saint just passed away. God takes pleasure in that saint that just passed away. Sometimes we get things flip-flopped. But this is why John 3, 16 and 17 are so vital to summarize the entire Bible. Jesus says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. 
Peter declares that same truth in 2 Peter 3, 9, where he says God did not desire, um, uh, he doesn't desire for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Even in the Old Testament, we hear God saying things like this, Ezekiel 33. Because a lot of times people like to say, well, the Old Testament God, he was mean and nasty. The New Testament God, well, Jesus softened him up. No, he didn't. God's the same yesterday. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is the same. He does not change. Ezekiel 33, 11 says to them, say to them, this is the Lord speaking, As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked... This is his heart's desire. Turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? Again, he doesn't take pleasure in the death of the wicked. He wants to see them turn to him. He wants to save them. On the other hand, Psalm 116, verse 15, it says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. He rejoices when one of his saints goes home to be with him. His perspective is, I can't wait to bring you here. We saw this last time in John chapter 17 where Jesus is just longing for us to be in, with him in glory. So even though we are in the great tribulation, the book of Revelation here, the time of God's wrath and judgment, we see this glimmer of hope. Look at verse 9 as he opens up the fifth seal. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Now we're going to see this same group a few different times in the book of Revelation. These are known as tribulation saints. And they cried out with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. And so here we have this massive group of people that are martyred during the Great Tribulation. I believe after the rapture takes place, there's going to be millions upon millions of people that get saved. It's going to be awesome when the Lord takes us out of here, and then people, and a lot of people you know, are probably going to be, <gasps> they were right. And there's going to be a witness. God always has a witness. We'll see that in the book of Revelation, chapter 7. He raises up, seals 144,000 Jews, 12,000 Jews from each of the 12 tribes. They will be like, you know, 144,000 Billy Grahams running loose. If you don't like Billy Graham, maybe Greg Laurie. If you don't like Greg Laurie, some other guy, like Billy Sunday or somebody. You know, there'll be 144,000 evangelists running, cre preaching the gospel. When we get to chapter 11, we'll see the first three and a half years, he has these two witnesses that are going to be at the base of the Temple Mount, where the Western Wall is, the Wailing Wall is today. And I believe it's Elijah and Moses, and they'll be calling fire down from heaven that anybody comes against them, and they'll be proclaiming the truth of God's word. People need to repent. Don't believe the Antichrist. Turn to Jesus Christ. When we see chapter 14, verse 6, the culmination of God's witness to this world that's lost and dying is this mighty angel he sends out into all the heavens, all around earth, with, you know, whatever, billion-watt speakers telling everybody to repent, and it tells us that he has the everlasting gospel to preach to every creature on earth. So God always has a witness. And don't forget about the billions of Bibles that are going to be left behind. CDs, tapes, all that kind of stuff. So if you're thinking, well, what if I miss it? Mel won't mind if you raid the bookstore once the rapture takes place. You can, welcome, you can have anything out of the bookstore you want. It's free for your taking after the rapture. You don't want to show up on Sunday and nobody be here. That would be a drag. But as a result, many people are going to be saved during this time. It won't be easy because most of the people that are saved during the Great Tribulation are put to death. They have their heads cut off. We'll see that as we go through this as well. If you take the mark of the beast, the 666, chapter 13, verse 18, I believe that uh, that's the, the final seal of your fate. If you take the mark of the beast, when we're out of here, you cannot be saved after that. I know there's a few teachers that say, even after you take the mark, no. It says, if you take the mark of the beast, there is no hope for salvation. 
Anyway, be that as it may, these people who get saved at this time, who are put to death for their newfound faith in Christ, they ask the Lord, how long will it be until you avenge our blood on those who killed us? And he says, just a little bit longer. Now we'll see that this group, they're also mentioned in chapter 20, when Jesus returns, we come back with them. One of the first things that happens, this group will receive their resurrection bodies at that time. The same group. They're known as tribulation saints. There's three groups of people that the Lord will have in heaven. The Old Testament saints, believing the promises of God. The bride of Christ, which is made up of you and me and all those who from Pentecost to the rapture were the bride of Christ. And then there's what we call the tribulation saints. We have different roles and responsibilities in the kingdom of God, but we're all saved. And that's the good news. We'll all be with the Lord. So three different groups of people that will be saved. Be that as it may, um, it says here they were slain for the word of God and for their testimony. They put their faith and trust in the Lord. So notice what happens when he removes the sixth seal, verse 12. I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake. The word great is mega. So think of a mega earthquake. I don't think we've had a mega earthquake yet in the world like these. Are gonna, there's three mentioned in the book of Revelation, and they will shake everything. There's a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. So there's going to be these tremendous cataclysmic events that are going to happen when the sixth seal is open, and there's going to be a massive earthquake. It says so massive that it's going to shake the entire world. And as it does, that probably explains why there's going to be, you know, the moon darkened, the sun darkened because of all the volcanic ash, because massive earthquakes will set off all these volcanoes. You look at a map, you see the ring of fire that goes all around the Pacific Ocean. There are so many volcanoes that are ready to erupt. And it's incredible. When these all start blowing their stacks, it's going to be unbelievable how heavy the air is going to be, how dark it's going to be. All these volcanoes erupting all over the world at the same time. It won't take very long for all the skies to be filled with volcanic ash. Some of us are old enough to remember Mount St. Helens, 1980, um, living in San Diego. And we even had some of the ash come that far. But for hundreds of miles, Mount St. Helens up in Washington, when it blew its top, it just covered so many areas. You see pictures, you know, thick ash all over the place. Uh, nasty. But that was 50 megatons, Mount St. Helens. In 1883, there was a volcanic eruption, Mount Krakakoa. You ever heard of that one? It was in Indonesia. It was 200 megatons. To give you perspective, the, the bomb they dropped on Hiroshima, Japan, that one atomic bomb, Krakatoa was 10,000 uh, 10, times greater than that atomic bomb. 10,000 times greater. When Krakatoa blew, and it didn't just blow once. I mean, it blew big, but it, it blew for like two months. It changed the weather for the next five years. It dropped the temperature, global cooling, two degrees during that time. It, it created a 120-foot wave that went all the way across the Pacific Ocean. You know, Los Angeles gets 14 inches on average every year. When that blew its top, uh, L.A. got... Uh, 34 inches of rain that year. I mean, it changed things tremendously. Uh, the island, Krakatoa, was just gone. I mean, it just disappeared, like it says here. Uh, another one has come up in its place. They call it um, Anak Krakatoa or Baby Krakatoa, and, and that's still growing as well. But when these things take place, when these things blow, it is going to be incredible, to say the least. Again, verse 13 we see that stars from heaven will fall to the earth from heaven. Don't, don't picture like, you know, these giant stars out there falling. The, the Greek word is aster, where we get the word for asteroid. You know, asteroids will start pelting the earth. It, you know, there's that big um, divot 
outside of Flagstaff, Arizona. It's a, a big hole. It's a crater. It was six, it's 600 feet deep. Some of you have been there. It's three quarters of a mile wide. And it's the result of one 60-ton asteroid hitting the Earth. And it made 600-foot divot, three quarters of a mile across. Can you imagine just bunches of asteroids hitting the Earth all at once? That's what we're going to see from heaven upon the Earth. Amazing times. The prophet Isaiah saw this same scene some 2,700 years ago. This is what he wrote in Isaiah 24. Starting in verse 19, it says, The earth is violently broken. The earth is split open. The earth is shaken exceedingly. The earth shall reel or stagger to and fro like a drunkard and shall totter like a hut. I mean, a hut's not very stable. Its transgression shall be heavy upon it, and it will fall and not rise again. Now, with all these cataclysmic events coming down upon planet Earth during this time of judgment, you would think the people on Earth would say, I think God's doing something here, and we need to repent and get right with God. Is that what they do? Apparently not. Look at verse 15. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, so all the upper echelon, Every slave and every free man, so the rest of mankind, hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. You've heard of Rambo? This is Lambo. This is Jesus. It's going to be brutal. But they recognize this is from the throne of God. This is the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of His wrath has come, and who is able to stand? So when the fifth seal opened, multitudes of martyred saints are calling out to, to God the Father. But here when the sixth seal is open, those on the earth are calling out to Mother Earth, calling out to the mountains, the rocks, fall on us, hide us protect us. So on the one hand, these people recognize that it's God's wrath and judgment, but they don't repent. They're, most people aren't turning to Jesus to save them. And all I can think of is the Antichrist has done a tremendous job in deceiving the people into thinking there is no God, or God hates you, or God doesn't love you, and he doesn't want you saved. I mean, he's going to be so deceptive that people aren't, a lot of them aren't turning to Jesus. But these people are absolutely correct when they say, for the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Nobody can stand. Nobody can challenge Jesus and his authority. He's the King of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He is God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Nobody can stand up to Jesus. But he's given us the strength to stand against the schemes of the enemy. He's given us the strength in the Holy Spirit so that we don't have to fall before the lies of the enemy. We can stand strong. Read Ephesians chapter 6. We don't have time to go through it, but over and over again, stand. Stand in these promises. Stand against. Stand strong in the Lord and the strength of His might. He's given us all that we need for victory. The world will not be able to stand before the Lord, but guess what? We who are saved, who are born again, we will stand in the presence of the Lord victoriously when he takes us home to be with him. For all of us, hopefully these verses will remind you, Jude verses 24 and 25 says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. You don't have to stumble and fall around. He's able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy. We're going to stand faultless before the Lord because we are in Christ. His blood has cleansed us of all sin. We're not standing in our own righteousness, but we're standing in the righteousness of Jesus. To God our Savior, who alone is wise, 
be glory and majesty and dominion and power both now and forever. Amen. So who can stand before Jesus? Well, all of us who have recognized we're sinners, but we realize Jesus is the Savior. We've repented and turned from our sin. We turn to the Lord and we receive him as our Lord and Savior. And he will save you because that's why he came 2,000 years ago to seek and to save those that are lost. So don't fight against the Lord. Surrender to him and experience the new life that he has for you.